know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace family. Um, it's so nice to be with you guys. It's, it's raining, raining over here on the um, East Coast, which has kind of slowed a lot of things down. But I'm so happy you guys are able to um, to hang out with us tonight. We have a really, you know, uh, we're going to have a fantastic evening. And I know that we are going to learn a lot. <laughs> um, so I just want to first um, just uh, just give some little shout outs to everyone. I see... Um, and you know what? And each time we do these, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have my glasses. Um, so I'm not squinting like just trying to read everyone's name. But I do see DM and Fundu, Kwaku, um, and the Internet Savior is all in the house to, um, this tonight. So peace to you guys. Um, first things first, if you have not seen Happy, the documentary, okay, we have Happy Talks, but we actually have a full length documentary that is two hours and 12 minutes um, long. And you can purchase it on our website. You can get a DVD or you can get a digital download of the film. Um, the Happy Talks came about because during COVID last year, we were about to release the film. We were gonna have a premiere at the Schomburg. And um, there's a website right there, happyfilm.com. So we were gonna have this uh, huge you know, celebration at the Schomburg. And, um, but then COVID happened and we, you know, we thought we was like, oh, it just, you know, maybe be a couple of weeks and we'll be able to get back out there and, um, reschedule our time and, um, have our premiere and start our city tour. Well, you know, now almost a year and a half later, um, and we're in a full fledged pan pandemic. Um, in the meantime, we were just like, you know, we didn't want to lose the steam of where we were with Hoppy. And so we we thought that if we just got online and maybe just interviewed one um, guest every week until this thing ended, that we would be able to um, keep the momentum and keep everybody excited about Hoppy. Well, Hoppy Talks ended up just taking taken on a whole entity of its own. And so we've had um, goo gobs of scholars come through and um, bless us with their information. And it's been very, very powerful. But Happy Talks is a um, derivative of the, the documentary. And so if you have not seen the documentary yet, you must, it's a must see. You can go to happyfilm.com, you can get your DVD or you can get a digital download. So when we're done um, tonight with uh, Professor Small and Dr. J, uh, you could just watch Happy. And, 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 you know, if you get the digital download, you just keep watching it. You can stream it as well. Um, so it's really important um, that everyone check out Happy. And also, um, if you go to happyfilm.com, there's a couple things you can do. We, um, you know, they're on the site. We also have a newsletter. And this newsletter goes out every month. And it has five different articles. We have an economic innovator that we talk about someone from the past who's laid the foundation, the financial foundation for us to be where we are now. So we um, showcase that person. We showcase a black business every single time. And sometimes there's a collection of um, black businesses. And then we also have a health article that we, um, you know, that we produce every month. And it's actually written by a couple. They are a comedic yoga um, married couple out of um, Georgia, Atlanta. Um, and uh, it's the, their names are um, Black Silt Yoga. You should check them out. Um, but, you know, so they, they write this article for us every month. And it's really, I mean, it's, they are like spot on every single time. They did a really nice one last month about just breathing and how we're supposed to use our breath to, um, to, you know, to bring all types of goodness to us. So that's another, you know, article that we do, the health article, the financial, um, Innovator, and we also do a financial one-on-one, which is written by um, a uh, a member of the Appeal Federal Credit Union, and uh, so that's always really good as well. And so you have those four articles, and then you have a happy update, 
Um, and in terms of an update, let me just give you a little something that's um, that we're working on. So tomorrow here, if you're in um, New York City, or even if you're like on the East Coast, or you're going to be visiting this weekend, we're going to be at the International African, um, uh, the, the International African American Festival. I believe that's the name, but you know what? When our, our guests come on, we're going to ask them because I know they know the name. So they've been going for way more years than we, you know, than I've been going there. Um, but we're going to be there. So, you know, if you're, um, you want to come by and check us out, we'll have all everything that we have on our website to be there. Um, myself as uh, well as uh, Taiki will also be there. So please stop by and say hi to us. Um, you know, let's get some pictures together, all of that good stuff. Um, so, you know, we'll be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and also if you want to support, cause there's many ways to support and by buying the DVD or the digital download, you're definitely supporting us and your money goes, um, you know, we, we spend our money with people that look like you and me. Um, and so it's a continuous circle of appreciation. Um, and you know, we, a lot of times we invest our money into like a lot of our guests that come on, um, but it, it really helps fuel the engine of Hoppy and, and getting the word out. So it's really important for you to, you know, to donate if you can um, and definitely buy merchandise. Tonight I have on, I have on my Hoppy shirt. There we go. Which we will have is it's online and we have it in two different colors, blue and orange. So feel free to go into happyfilm.com and get you one or come by the booth um, this weekend. Um, and also, and so if you have all our merchandise, you're just like, okay, I have everything, you know, you can always hit us up, show us a little love on the cash app. It's dollar sign, happy film. That's a, um, a way. But now this way that I'm getting ready to tell you um, is a way that every single person can donate. Okay. And, and, and what I mean is donate with your button, with your finger, hit the like button and send this video to three other people. Um, it's really important that we, um, you know, uh, we got to break this algorithm. And the way we do that is by you actually liking the video and sharing it, but then also commenting. And I also see Reggie. What's up, Reggie? I see Reggie's in the house. Um, Henry Jones. Yeah, every, you guys are coming through. That's that's what's up. Marva, um, Frida, Saeed. Um, nice to see you, Saeed. Um, Angel B. So, um, you know, it's really important for you guys to like the video, to share it with some other people, and then comment. Those things go a very long way. All right. So um, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first guest, um, and I think, you know what, it's like a, t it's, it's a tie between Professor James Small and Dr. Uh, Renoko Rashidi in terms of who has been on Hoppy Talks the most. <laughs> and so it's, it's like, you know, we, I, we, we're always seeing you guys and we love it. How you doing, Professor? I'm good, sister. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, I'm peeping in here um, and I don't, I don't see Dr. Jeffries. I tell you that Dr. Jeffries is quick. He's quick. <laughs> I, 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 I try to pin him down and he's just gone. Um, so we're going to wait for him to, to have a little seat and uh, we'll, we'll get started. So how are you doing today? Well, it's been a long day. Um, I told you, I just left my front yard with this huge tree off of this, this huge limb off of this 200 year old tree fell. Oh. So I was out there cutting it off the fence in the rain, me and my wife. So we got at least that off the fence. So the rest we'll deal with tomorrow. And early in the day, I had to go and have a stress test. You know, that can be trying. Yes. Running on the treadmill, hooked up to all those wires, and then lying down and people watching your heart go tum -tum -tum, and then at least I get to watch it too and see what your heart looks like. Yeah. But that took yeah. up, you know, my usual two hour trip to and from Brooklyn every morning. So that's my day. And uh, waiting for a happy talk. Yay. Okay, I see. I see. Doctor Jeffries is sitting down. I think he has his collection. I'm agreeing with you, Reggie, because um, I said, "Where's Doctor J?" And he said, "Red." Uh, he said that uh, Doctor J is probably collecting his books, which I'm sure he is. How you doing? How you doing, Doctor J? I'm doing reasonable for 
somebody who's 85 and still alive and ain't about no jive. So, uh, 84, I, he was on the go, 83, he was with me. So, I guess 82. We but wasn't it, through. 82, we wasn't through. We still had okay. some heavy things to do. And 81, we still having fun. Dr. J had a cliche for every age. So. Oh my God, I like that. You know, I think I'm about to start getting a little cliche for mine, too. I like that. That's what's up. But he goes at 21 and still having fun? Uh, that's just about it. Heading toward heading toward 91. And it ain't ready. Ain't finished. Ready for ready for the whatever we got to do. Yeah. I tell you, you move fast. You are a fast, uh, a fast guy. <laughs> okay. Well, my wife might say he ain't fast enough because we got a lot of things to do. And he takes his time, and uh, and sometimes she's ready to push me a little harder. Hey, but anybody who's been with a brother or sister for more than 50 years, there's a special place in God's creation for them. Mm. And so, uh, I, you know, and Brother Small, no, he's been around a long time, in other mm. words. And yeah, I think he celebrated 52, right? 50 years of marriage. What? No, I said, no, I, no, I was thinking you, you celebrated 50 years as well this year, correct? Or was it last year? This year, but 51. 51. So, yeah. Wow, that's what's up. Okay, well, you know what? This is so, I'm so happy that we're talking about this because this is what we're going to talk about um, today. So, um, Remember, it's all a struggle. It's not no. Was who who made that poem? It's not no paradise. It's just the struggle. Right. You know? And, and that's that's the struggle with the world. How do people learn to be and how to be together and accomplish something in the process? Because it all comes to an end at some point. You know? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I like that. It's not paradise. It's a struggle. Um, so, uh, so let's let's just back up with in terms of before we even get to the part of marriage. Um, so today, you know, there's been a lot of um, emphasis placed on this term called the high valued black man. Okay, um, what did that look like, or not look like in traditional African culture? I think the concept is so negative um, that I don't even know how to refer to it. I mean, you have to be in a place where you don't value yourself so that you can then make a reference to self-value in that sense. Um, I've heard the cliche and the term, and it really sounds like just the play on white bourgeoisie and black face. Um, you know, so I don't know what else are they talking about. Um, a high valued black man would be, um, oh, I forgot our brother, but he passed away a few years ago. Um, he probably most of his life was homeless. Um, but he was on 125th street giving out information about black people every day of his life. He was at every rally. He was at every event. He went, came to every Malcolm X celebration for the last 56 years. He talked to every young person that passed 125th Street and 7th for 40 years. To me, that's a high value black man, you know? And the problem is you, the high value black men don't really get valued by those who say they're looking for value because their measurement of what manhood and value is don't come from Africa, you know, it come from the Europeans. So if I'm saying high valued black man, first thing I think of the Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Malcolm X, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, um, Reggie Mabry, um, Brother Rick, um, Brother Charles. To me, when I think of a high valued black man, of those men that I've known over my 75 plus years that value themselves, value their race, 
and then make efforts to change the world for the better for themselves and their race. Most of the black men <coughs> who do those things are not held in value, high value by most black people until after they're dead and usually only then when white people make an acclaim of them, you know, because I can think of multiple names of black men and women who should be right beside or above Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad and most people don't know their name. They don't know Martin Delaney. They don't know Bishop McNeil Turner. They don't know T. Thomas Fortune. They don't even know Booker T. Washington. They don't know uh, the men who made up the African Blood Brotherhood, who was the one in the street with the guns fighting to defend Black Wall Street. Um, they don't know those men. So if you're gonna talk about having a definition for high value, then you have to say, when Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael was marching, that 1,500 to 2,000 black men and women who was with them, those men and women, teenagers, were the high value black men and women in our community and nobody knows their name. When the people march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, we learned about um, our brother who was in Congress and a couple of others. But there was a thousand to 1500 more people who was as courageous, if not more courageous, that was on that bridge and we don't know their names. They're the high value black people. And, and, and we have to change. Um, yesterday, thanks to the high value people, the Dr. Clark, the Leonard Jeffries, the James Turner, the Shashi McIntyre, the Barbara Sizemore, the, the Barbara Norris, those people who fought to open up the universities so that this generation let us see more black men and women with master's degrees and PhD degrees and professional degrees than ever in our history. So when they talk about high value, Talk about the people that opened the doors that made it possible for those who now want to put a value on themselves based on credentializations from universities teaching anti-African reality. Let's look at who the real high value is. Mm. They did it with a hope that if we create this opportunity, then people will get these credentials and come back to the black community and liberate us and thus can be called high value. Now, many have come back. Let me not undercut those who come back. I think most of our young people from this generation have returned in one capacity or another, either teaching or lawyer or doctors or social workers or in the movie industries. And they're trying to say something to better the black community, do something to better the black community. So when we talk about high value black men, Let's talk about black men that put the divine first, Ooh. Africa second, family third, and themselves fourth. If that's what you're talking about, then you're talking high value. Yes. Okay. You said divine first, and mm -hmm. then them, then um, then Africa, then Africa, family, then family, and then themselves. Oh, yeah. that's what's up. Yeah. Um, Dr. Jeffries, you have anything to, to add to that? Well, <laughs> Professor Small and I have been on in this linkage for decades. And mm -hmm. so when he makes an announcement and, and he analyzes things that furthers myself, and then it spreads out to others, like although he's not in our conversation now, but we can't make these definitions and these analyses without thinking of a, a Dr. Wade Nobles. Yeah. And when you think about Dr. Wade Nobles, you can't leave him out there by himself because he's got Dr. Vera uh, Nobles by his yeah. side. And then the off springs their children are uh, making uh, the messages uh, real. And so, and then when you have Dr. Nobles connected, you got Naeem Akbar and Naeem Akbar has left his mark. And I remember when I, 
I was giving the so-called Albany speech. He had just finished giving his speech and he was there with his twin boys at the Albany uh, presentation that the people tried to uh, demonize and say it's the worst thing that ever happened. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and the, the worst thing is the truth. And that's the great difficulty. We have to speak this truth. We've been asked by the generations of Africans to carry that burden on, on our shoulders. And we're doing it in a fantastic way. But in doing it, there's a lie that has been perpetuated and it's living out. Uh, wherever we look, it's, it's there. Now it's coming from China. Uh, with the Asians saying that they have inherited the universe. And so that means they've inherited Africa. Uh, for years, the Europeans uh, had this kind of mentality because Christopher Columbus got lost. He didn't know where the hell he was. And then when they finally thought he was in off of China, uh, they made contact with, with the powers that be, Spain and Portugal. And then they contacted the Vatican. And then they divided up the world between these two insignificant nations and uh, gave it the papal decree uh, that one half of the universe is Spain's, the other half is Portugal, and they have the right to take anything that's there and enslave any person or group of people that's there. So we have to understand that it's not just a few individuals here, there, it's whole movements, whole historical uh, uh, moments that we have to be aware of. Uh, and so people talking to me about Christopher Columbus, they don't understand it. I don't even want to hear the name Christopher Columbus. You talk about the death uh, of our uh, people. And, uh, but he did not have a papal authority. But papal bulls, after his so-called uh, discovery, the Pope had to divide up the world between two insignificant Catholic nations. And they did. And we're living that down now. So as we search for this truth, it's going to devastate a whole lot of people because they can't handle it. And then when our great scholars began to dig in terms of the ecology of the universe, and they came up with a northern cradle and a southern cradle, and then one a brave white man had to talk about the ice people's inheritance. And uh, but when I grabbed it and said, well, if you got ice peoples in the northern cradle, then in the southern cradle, you got sun people. So there's a dynamic between ice peoples and some people. Oh, that's the worst thing in the world. Oh, how could anybody say that? You know, the scholars and other people, historians and scientists, philosophers have been looking at that. They can make pronouncements. But if uh, Professor Smalls or Professor Wade Nobles and, and uh, Dr. Francis Chris Welsing and all of these others, uh, Leonard and Riles and Jeffries, uh, then we're, uh, we're the worst people in the history of the world. And we're trying to find out how the people in the world can get together and move so that the world can be shared and that a meaningful uh, process can take place around the world. So luckily, this mantle has been given to us. We've been able to take it and, uh, and wear it and pass it on. So I don't see any of us standing out there by themselves. If you talk about our great sister, Dr. Frances Chris Welsing, then an associate of hers began to emerge. She jumped into the African thing faster than Dr. Francis Chris Welsing. But Dr. Francis Chris Welsing had this this uh, press board. They, uh, but she's saying that we're only on the white side. We, we, we haven't even crossed over on the black side of the chessboard and getting heavy and deep into our African cultures. But her associate, Dr. Pat Newton, became uh, queen mother uh, Nana, Segment, and all the things that Francis had talked about that you get on that African side, the dark side of the chessboard, uh, Dr. Pat Newton, and she absorbed it all. She became a part of it and uh, left here with that understanding and that appreciation. So those two sisters stand as a duality and a polarity of great African knowledge and, and, and strength, just as Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, people say, oh, Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben are different. Well, they certainly are. They're probably two of the most different scholars that we have ever had. But they partnership in an African family way. Dr. Clark was the elder. 
And no matter what Dr. Ben thought and what he did, he respected eldership. And so he 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 did it in such ways that it it bewildered us. I remember when we had the First World Alliance and all of the scholars were there, the community people were there. People used to run up from 145th subway station to get to the next block to get into that church. And it was such a rush up the hill to get into the church, they had to establish that no male sits, all females and children and elders have to have their seats. And so the brothers realized that physically they could make it up the hill before anybody else, but there was an African process in place. They can't bust in and get up front and sit in the front seats. No, they had to, they finally became uh, warrior scholars. They, they stood, they created a whole wall, front, back and whatnot. Not, and then the elders and the women and the children and whatnot were there as a protective unit uh, in reality and psychology and psychologically they were getting that type of understanding. So we've been able to make strides that we can't even imagine. When Dr. Ben, honoring his elder partner, Dr. Clark, who took on the world by themselves and then together, and Brother Smalls, he'll stay out of this conversation, but I remember when Dr. Ben took his mystery belt, one of the most important things he had in his great collection of things. And he took the, the mystery belt, the medallions off, and he ceremonially put them on his elder, Ooh. Dr. Clark, as if to let us know there are higher things than what we think is the high thing. He was saying, that, and of course, Brother Smalls has gone deep into all of these systems so he has to write a special book if they allow him to, uh, but he has to figure out some way of getting out for people trying to build to understand that certain structures and whatnot have been built. And we, we need to tap into that knowledge and don't start from, uh, from page one when there is a whole process. I most recently uh, was trying to relax last night and then this slipped out of out of its place and and here is Amana, the city of Akhenaten and Nefertiti Nefertiti Aspero and this is by I guess the white lady Julia Sampson but what it does have in here is this whole new city that was built and all the images of Queen T and and uh, whatnot uh, are there. So the idea of a holy city uh, uh, is not something that comes just from Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Africans uh, use this use of the universe to create a, a city of, of the sun and temple of the moon and the sun. So they were relating not just to the, to the natural human uh, earth place, they were relating it to the universe. And so this came out just in time uh, because uh, we're trying to put the various books and, and documents uh, that are gonna be important uh, together. And uh, okay. to tie that up, here you have an ancient comedic historical moment. And then I found Jean Afrique. Jean Afrique is one of their magazines like Ebony and whatnot. And on the cover of this Jean Afrique is Oufouet Boigny, president of the Ivory Coast, and uh, his story. And this is Jean Afrique economics. And what he was doing, he created, he helped to create an economic miracle in the Ivory Coast in terms of the exploitation of their tropical products, coffee, cocoa, uh, bananas, etc., And this small nation grew economically so fast that it 
challenged a nation that was 10 times or more its size in terms of the major products. In other words, the economy of the Ivory Coast was so structured to work for the African peoples that it paralleled Brazil, which is most of a continent. South America is mostly Brazil. And they challenged Brazil in coffee, challenged Brazil in palm products, challenged to Brazil in, in uh, uh, cocoa. And so how did this miracle took place? He had a dream and he got together with folks and he hooked it to the Rosicrucian movement and uh, people who said he built a big cathedral. But that's not, that was a centerpiece, but that wasn't the important thing. There was a whole restructuring of how economics works and how it's shared and how you relate it to, to the state as well as to the farmer, the peasant farmer. So that's a story that, that luckily I've studied and lived. So I, I'll be able to put that out there in some real terms. But just to find the same date, the Amana story, and Taki uh, has special blessings coming for me forever because he, he took us to uh, Tel Amana. We went up and down the hills. We went up into the, uh, it was an unbelievable experience to actually uh, visit Tel Amana and then go to the great temples in Luxor and, and whatnot, and the Valley of the Kings and the Queens. But then to leave that and fly down to Khartoum and then go all the way down the Nile to Jebel Barka. And so just that experience alone, Taki is forever, I'm forever indebted to him for having that experience. So Dr. Ben opened up the Luxor area and Thebes and whatnot, and Brother Taki took us. Actually, Dr. Ben did try to take some people into Nubia. And unfortunately, if you don't have a good guide, you're in trouble. So they got lost in the desert. Wow. And so it's dangerous. But they finally found their way back. And I can understand, because when Taki and I got our drivers, you see nothing but desert. And then you wonder, are they going in the right position? But then I learned that if you look straight ahead and you see a toothpick on the horizon, you can relax because you're within distance of a mosque and around the mosque is a whole uh, life giving community. So you can relax, even though you may be 20 miles away from where you're supposed to go, you're heading in the right direction. <laughs> so we've got to tell some of this to our folks so they just don't think that we're fabricating it or pulling it out of uh, somebody's uh, crazy mind. We're talking about the reality. And to go into the, to see Jebel Baca, all in this flatland, and all of a sudden here is this land mass just in front of us. And, uh, and then it is designed. And around it are seven or eight of the temples that are similar to the temples that are in, uh, in Luxor and in the, uh, the part of the now that we usually refer to. So I have to give thanks for the opportunities. I'm very happy knowing that this knowledge was given to me and we'll be able to share it. Um, Brother uh, Taki's very good friend, Brother Nate, he, him and myself, uh, we have a picture of us at the, the altar at Jebel Barco. And that's at the foot of the Amun Temple which extends out from Jebel Barco to uh, the world. And then just above it is the temple for the female. And it has pillars opening at the opening, but it is cut into the mountain because the female life giving process starts with the vagina and the ovaries and the internal development that the female has, but the male has genitals extending out. So they've actually taken the human experience of creating life and putting it in their monumental buildings. That altar was above uh, myself and, and uh, our brother from uh, the Sudan. Uh, and luckily it was getting dark, but we have a picture of it. So these- you also, Oh, you also have a movie, you know, and for those that don't know, 
that um, Taiki, um, he memorialized that trip. And um, he uh, has a, that was his first actual film was called Nubia. And Dr. J is in there. And so you get to see a lot of these images that, that he's talking about. And you can get that video from, um, it's only on DVD right now. But if you go to happyfilm.com, you can get the video and see it and see what Dr. J is talking about. Well, let me bring us back, Dr. J, if you don't mind. What do you call it? High value black man? Is that? Yes. What's the term? Yeah, it's high valued black man. Oh. Well, high, well maybe, no, no maybe. I think it's called high valued man. Well, maybe what we ought to do is give them a list of 50 truly high value models right. for them to emulate so they can identify a high value black man. I'm not interested in any other man. I'm not interested in no Asian man, European. They don't exist, you know, except at our periphery as an antagonist. Mm -hmm. That's what they've always been. So I want to call out some names that I think people, you want to see what the model of a high value black man is, then you got to start with the Prince Hall, mm -hmm. you know, who founded the Free African Lodge. You got to start with a Frederick Douglass. Then you got to go to Africa and you got to look at a President Jerry Rollins. Then you got to go to Burkina Faso and you got to look at President Sankara. Then you got to come back to Ghana and you got to look at President Nkrumah. Then you got to go to Tanzania and look at President Magafuli. God bless their souls. And then you got to look at Julius Nyeri. Then you got to come back to America and look at H. Rap Brown. They call him Brother Jamil today, but history knows him as H. Rap Brown. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about a high value man? You know, then you want to look at Dr. Asa Hilliard. Yes. Dr. Jacob Carruthers, mm -hmm. and Dr. Jeffries just mentioned one brother, um, Ufudwani, um, in Cote d'Ivoire. We need to study these great people. We need to look at some of the great Asantehenis of the Ashanti nation. That's right. We need to look at some of the great Onis of the Yoruba civilization. And then we need to come back to the Caribbean. And you got to look at Dr. Edward Scobie. You want to look at a model of a black man? So I'm just dropping the names. Yes. And you all need to do the research. Then you can have a discussion with high value, but you got to have some model of what a high valued black man is. You got one sitting right here in the likes of Dr. Leonard Jeffries. See, if you don't have no model, what are you talking about? Because you got to model after something. All right. We've had the most extraordinary array of high valued black men and women. But since we just raising the issue of the high valued black men, we've had for centuries the most extraordinary. Somebody said, well, I want to be in writing. I want to do newspapers. Well, you can't even have that discussion unless you talk about a T. Thomas Fortune, okay? You know, you, you talk about medicine, then you talk about Charles Drew. There's so many of our high valued people we have taken for granted. We have all the models we need. We don't have to make believe pattering around white supremacy and the notion of white bourgeoisie owning things and, and running around corporate white America, helping to exploit the world to find high valued people because you won't find them there. And those uh, are low valued people. And taking a, a carver and then not thinking that he invented the sweet potato or the uh, peanut, no, he studied nature. He was sold for a mule and he was able to get his freedom and bond with Booker T. So when you're talking about Booker T. Washington and what he did, he allowed for George Washington Carver to be in his laboratories at Tuskegee where he discovered the uses of sweet potato and the peanut and everything else and it changed the Southern economy. It saved them from the destruction of civil war. This brother it has to be seen as a multi-genius who spoke to the plants, had another spiritual understanding. And luckily, he, he's one of the main, uh, he's recognized at Tuskegee University. You have all the buildings, of course, that Booker T outlined, and then you have the uh, Carver Scientific Center. 
etc. Then you have the Tuskegee Airmen, who were not even uh, uh, allowed to be full airmen, but they proved their worth. Right. But see, that's why the key is whenever people start using these terms, mm -hmm. tell them, show me the model. Yes. And what we just gave, Dr. Jeffries just gave one of our most extraordinary scientific models in the history of North America. You know, what Carver did with using the peanuts, what they call ground nuts or ground, to restore mm -hmm. nitrogen to the soil that had been depleted by the cotton use of the soil. And he realized the reason you couldn't get a good grow of cotton after the third year, because it had used up the nitrogen. So he used the peanut and the sweet potato to restore the nitrogen to that land and created rotating crop planting, which is something they were doing in Africa from time immemorial. But the key thing is a term like high valued black man, that's a good term, mm -hmm. but show me your models. Yes. Yeah, I need to know the models. Don't give me some white boy or hoochie mama running around in a Mercedes with no respect for family, self or culture or history or spirituality and tell me that's high value because he got some money and he's invested in Wall Street and he's flying on a Learjet. Because mm -hmm. our murderers do all of that every day. Our rapists mm -hmm. do that every day. Mm -hmm. Our robbers do that every day. So mm -hmm. when you talk about high value, give me your model. Yes. And I'll, I'll be able to make a decision whether what you're saying is making sense to me. You know? Yeah. So you know what, so, um, so when we're looking at, um, within the African culture, when we're looking at the relationship between males and females, like what historically has that looked like? Family. See, what we do in the West, we start with the pieces trying to make a whole, but in Africa, you, try, you start with the whole and then discuss the pieces. It's the family, and the family is then made up of a man, a woman, and children, and then the, the extensions of that, the aunties, the uncles, the nieces, the nephews, the cousins. But mm -hmm. you start with the concept that the family is the primary object. Everything else must conform to build that. You see? The family, that's the primary object. Not building the man or building the female or the woman got this power, the man's got this power. No, the family the needs of the family determine the roles of its elements. Wait, say it one more time. The <laughs> needs of the family determine the role of its elements, meaning the female element, the male element, the children element, etc. The needs of the family determine those roles. Those roles don't determine the design of the family. The family itself is an imitation of God. See, and that, that's the key thing that people don't understand. When Africa talk about a family, you're talking about imitating what we know as God. And what do we know as God? The universe as God. The totality of creation is what the Africans saw as the divine. So he imitated that. So just the three of us are here. There are times when Dr. Jeffries is the sun and you and I are the moon. There are times when Felicia is the sun and me and Dr. Jeffries is the moon and vice versa. What it means is that there are times when you give off the light that will give us the guidance on the way and we reflect that light as we share it with others and vice versa. So the African understood that the family had to be a reflection of cosmology and ecology and all of its elements would then be informed of what their role is depending on what the family needs are. You, you didn't define the individual, you defined the family. The family then defined the individual. Mm. You see? But in the white world, it's the individual that gets defined. And so we have- You be damned. <laughs> yes. In the African tradition, you have what I call the sacred triangle. And that's that special, where I process information, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, mind, body, and spirit. And you have the female, the male, and the child. And then when we started the Black Studies Movement in San Jose, my wife and I went out there in 69. And we, before we came to the city, we had that three-year experience of setting up one of the most comprehensive Black Studies programs in the world. And so, and this is the, again, this is the, the first year summary 
And again, what did we do? We have the female, the queen from uh, uh, Nigeria, you had King Tut tying in the, the male out of the Nile Valley, and you have our great figure, uh, Malcolm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. This is what the first year in 1969-70, when we took classes to Africa, we set up a summer institute that had traveling to our Black America for a month, and then you traveled to the African continent for a month. And uh, Dick Gregory read us spiritually, so he asked my wife and I to take his uh, oldest children to Africa. And the oldest children was 11 and eight year older, Lynn and Michelle. And they went, the first of the Gregory 10 plus children, and they established the pattern for those younger brothers and sisters. So Dick and his great wife, Lillian, had a, they had a plan. They didn't know what the fruit was gonna be, but they gave us their children. That's the same time that Alex Haley asked us for help. I'm failing. And that's at the same time that uh, John Carlos returned from the Olympics. He had been run out of the Olympic village, but he came into an African family. Rosen and I are very close to him, even to this day. His wife was in our classes at San Jose. His wife is from New York, he's from New York. His wife's sister was in our classes, Yasmin. She helped to design some of these work. And she had uh, uh, her husband to be male, Terry, uh, from California. They all went on this uh, process that we had, uh, put, we put in place. So these are the things we gotta let folks know, to know that you, you are called upon to achieve great things. And it's not gonna be uh, some something way out in the sky that you cannot. But the sacred triangle of man, mind, body, and spirit of male, uh, a female, male, and child uh, is key and important. So in this uh, page is in pages, the course outlines and the activities that we had, all, all of that has uh, been captured. And uh, we had an earlier version which has our newspaper and there's uh, and our people, youngsters in, in the, in the early, uh, well, it was 69 uh, and 70. So Brother Small has had a fantastic life experience. My wife and I have had similar. Of course, Brother Small's uh, wife has been in the medical field. And so she's had a, a chance not only to, reverse, to develop her profession, but to be uh, with uh, James through all of the trials and tribulations uh, that we've had. And so we have to see this as an enormous family affair that we need to share uh, with, uh, with others. And so we've been doing that. And uh, when I mentioned uh, another thing that was just right there on the top, just popped out, camera <laughs> just popped out. And this this is a brother who was a relative of Sekou Toure. Mm -hmm. Sekou Toure grew up in his father's home. But when they got into some difficulty, he left Sekou Toure and went to Senegal. But it was a, it was a family uh, uh, dispute. And so he, he, but him and his wife in Guinea had nine kids. So he took those nine kids uh, with him to uh, Senegal. Eventually he had one or two children born in Senegal. But the personal relationships, the support uh, that they got from their cultures and Carol I lived with us in our home over uh, on the other side of town. He lived with us for a year and a half in the, we had a finished basement. And so he was very happy to be treated like family. And then upstairs we had a master bedroom suite. And we at one point gave that to Tresiliano, one of the greatest Brazilian artists and his wife, Paula, and they were there for a year or two. Uh, and uh, and uh, not too long after that, the Akinjobans came. One of our greatest brothers who was a part of the Yoruba tradition and did his great work uh, in that area. And Akinjoban and his wife, well, I think we shared the same birthday in January, uh, Josephine and two of their children 
lived with us for two or three years. And that was, he was able to make a great contribution in our struggle for the truth. And one of that great contribution was, we met in 1972, dealing with demanding civilization uh, culture that the world conference took place. And it was at that point that we all sat around and we said, wait a minute, we're having these conferences in Europe. The next conference on Africa should be in Africa. Mm. And so I made that suggestion and they all followed it up. And so the next conference uh, in 1972, we were in England, 73, Akin Jobin was with me in at City College and he stayed for several years. And then he went back to prepare the Yoga Civilization Conference held in uh, Ile Ife in, in 76. And so uh, these are the things that no one knows about when they critique you and say that you're not a scholar, you've never achieved anything, where's your publications? You have to look at what great men and women and families do. They leave their mark. And so we, we've been bathing in this. It's so fantastic to be, it, it, it's, you can't even explain it. Uh, Kamara Lai just adopted himself uh, uh, as a brother uh, of mine. And he almost had a heart attack uh, because of that. He, they couldn't let me get on a plane. They were holding my, up my ticket. He jumped on the middle of something in the middle of the airport, raising so much hell. I did get on that plane, but the next day I, they told me he had to go to the hospital because he had a virtual heart attack. I, he continued after that, but I'm saying, here is him, one of our outstanding writers and uh, uh, philosophs, and here he is uh, in the hospital, but... Uh, so that, Dr. J, see, that's the key, and that's why this topic, but she first mentioned this high-value man, a high-value black man, I go like, I don't even want to discuss it. <laughs> but then I realized how many people in the world know camera line, you know? Yes. How many people in the world know Akin Jobin? You know, I've got what a professor, I, I was blessed, Dr. Jeffries brought him to City College and I was blessed to have been one of his students. And, you know, I'm blessed to always use one of his latest book. Yes. On the Yorba <laughs> Civilization and Culture before he passed away. And I this know, is a small know. book, he's written, huge history texts on the Yoruba people. But these are high valued black men. These are the models. And if they, when people are talking about high valued black men, show me the model. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeffries is showing you some models. Um, we didn't use, and certainly I, I'm his student and I learned from him, we didn't use European models or value system to determine the worth and value of African scholarship. And had we not taken that path that Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben and others, Dr. Hilliard led us, this whole concept we're seeing now of um, African awakeness would not have taken place. Mm -hmm. Because those who tried to marginalize our history in the so-called white academy, we don't even know those Negroes' names. They got good jobs. They got a nice home in the suburbs, but nobody looks to them for guidance or anything because they didn't guide us away from Europe back to Africa. They tried to guide us from what was left of Africa and us back to Europe. Mm. So, thank God we met Dr. Jeffries who did just the opposite. Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Dr. Hilly, Dr. Carruthers, uh, uh, Dr. Malefi Asante, uh, Dr. Wade Nobles, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Malana Karanga. We have to say, show me the model. Mm -hmm. They are, yes, I agree. They're high value black men. But show me the model that you're making that value determination from. Mm -hmm. you see? And when I see that model, you know, when I see Patrice Lumumba as a model, I say, yeah, okay, we, we're cool, you know. Um, when I see Nkrumah as a model, all right? When I see Denmark Vesey as a model, when I see Christoph as a model, um, 
to send over to as a model. Jean Jacques Dessalines as a model. Mm -hmm. so, in the rebellion in South Carolina in 1725 as a model. Then yes. I go, okay, that's a high value black man because the model you use determined the value. Mm -hmm. All right. And the African family is the foundation. Dr. Jeffries was showing that trinity on, on the back of their uh, document from San Jose. When we see Aset, Asar, and Haru, mm -hmm. um, they've been known by the name Aset. Aset is all black women. Mm -hmm. Asar is all black men. And Haru is all black child, children. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what it was saying, the only image of God that has any credibility is that image that shows the family as the reflection of divinity. I'm gonna take a phone call. Why? Because it's from someone. Let me just. Go. Yes, Nadia, I'm on. An, I'm on. A, I'm on. Um. Uh, and uh, this is why I love about happy talks because oh, no, no tell them to come back. We do it come on. Go back on. These are the essential black men yeah. right here. Um, I got it off the phone. Here's a copy oh, of the There's my man in the middle of it, Alex Haley. All right. Okay. He's been given uh, the credit for having done so much. But Alex couldn't do what Alex did without the help of some important black men and women. Ooh. And they helped to make Roots the reality. And uh, they helped to guide him in the path that he was on. So he, here's a beautiful picture of him with the family of Kunta Kenti. And Roz and I have a similar picture of ourselves in the picture. But with, with us, we made sure that Benta Kenti is sitting in front of us. It so happened the photographer wanted her in this photo. So they've got Alex sitting and they were all sitting or standing around him. But we have a photo that's more to the tradition. <clears throat> this elder is in the centerpiece and the rest of us are around her. So we really have to tap into the, the, the true, true history that gives us the strength. Otherwise we, we will be uh, confused and, and not be able to uh, make our moves. One of the interesting thing, uh, this is for a laugh, but it could have been a tragedy. The camera lie came to live with us, and he was in the apartment we had uh, fixed up. And then uh, I went there one day to see him, and the man was sick as he could be. So I said, we got to go to the hospital. I said, do you have any pills and stuff from, from your hospital? And he said, oh, yes. And so maybe the hospital can uh, refill it, fill this up. So we went to Holy Name Hospital, one of the biggest hospitals. There's three big hospitals in Teaneck, and uh, that's one of the part of the big three. So when they looked at his medicine and they got some information that they thought they needed, they asked us, Who, where's this fellow from? He's from Africa. Well, they say, this medicine that he has is only used for experimentation on animals in America. I said, what? She said, we cannot take him in here. This medicine is only used for experimentation on animals. So I didn't fool, throw up my hands and start jumping around. And I said, come on, camera light. Get into my car. We're going to Harlem. We went to Harlem, James. Mm -hmm. That whole block in Harlem where the doctors are, where uh, Sister Ella had uh, Malcolm's office and whatnot. 139th Street. 139th Street. Oh, 138, 139. We went there and went to the first black doctor and they took care of Kamala Rely. Didn't have to worry about a thing. If we had depended upon the, some white folks looking for security to help our people out, we would have we would have lost that brother. He had many, many years uh, to go in his great uh, journey. And so this is why we have to have our own traditions, our own understanding. Yeah, you know, speaking of that, Dr. J, um, Okay, wait. Actually, I'm going to take a little commercial break and I'm going to come back. We're going to pick up right to what, what you said because I want us to talk about rites of passage. But um, before we get there, I just want to just um, thank um, Donnie Williams for his donation. Thank you, Donnie. And um, we're getting some cash app love um, from Ronnie um, Gerido and um, John Carlos. I'm going to put you guys' name in the um, chat in a minute. John it's Carlos. John, John Carlos. Yeah, that's probably John. He always be tuning in. 
<laughs> okay, okay. Uh, wow, that's a New York boy who hit the world. And 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 everywhere I go, even if I'm at the great uh, temples in Egypt, I got my black fist raised. That's a tribute to John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, at the Olympics in 1968. Yeah, absolutely. I got to pull up this picture. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to uh, contribute um, to to the Happy Movement. Um, and, you know, I use Happy Movement because it is an actual movement <laughs> um, and we're growing, um, you know, into this movement. But the movement right now consists of four principles. One is you have to love black people. That's the first principle. Two, you have to um, support black businesses. Three, you have to become financially um, astute with your money. And four, you have to teach the youth the truth. OK. Eventually, we're going to get a health, um, you know, principle in there. But right now, that you know, this is our happy movement. Um, these two gentlemen here are the uh, impetus for the for happy. Period. We wouldn't even known to make happy. Taki says it all the time. If it weren't for these two gentlemen here and Infudishi, who's not here to, to, um, tonight, but um, please um, make sure you guys are liking this video. Share this video. I'm telling you, it's, you guys are um, dropping so much knowledge and we need for for this to be everywhere. Um, so please, please, please um, make sure that you guys are sharing this video and liking the video so that um, others can be able to, um, you know, to see this. And Amphidisi is here spiritually and he's carved out his own path and it, it involves training for the youth and, and other activities. Oh, so yeah. We, we don't separate ourselves. Into, I don't think Brother Smalls and I, if we had a fallen out, we probably went and talked to a tree before we went and beat <laughs> each other up. And so that's, that's the way it is. So we, the, the warrior principle, Empedici and, and a host of others have developed that. And that's part of the her training and, and whatnot that you had said you wanted to introduce us. Yeah. Uh, I want you guys to um, talk about... Um, the significance of rights, the rights of passages for us. You want to go there now? Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, first, let me say hello to my little daughter. I saw her name pop up a little while ago. Chan Money. Hi, Chan Money from your daddy. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Your Uncle Lenny. Hey, Chan. You know, I saw, I saw, I, I saw that per, I, I, was, you know, I was looking at the name. I was like, oh, I wonder is this some Professor Paul's oh, yes. family? Yeah, that's oh, what's she, up. She, that's my baby down in Virginia. She teaches and lives in Hampton. Um, but she's always on Happy Talk, you know. So, yes, yes. I want to greet her. But yeah, rights, remember, rites of passage, just the name, rites of passage. It means you have to earn the right mm. to pass into responsibilities in the community. So rites of passage is a process by which men and women are prepared to take on a certain responsibility in their community at a certain age. And different age categories requires a certain amount of training and process in order to take on those responsibilities. So normally we, we know the rites of passage of puberty and that's what we focus heavily on over here. When a child gets 15 or 16, and then we have use the rites of passage ceremony. If you like the Blue Nile and others, you got a process that takes a couple of years. And I know Sister Khadija has a process that takes a couple of years of training these young women so that when they become 21, they are prepared to be uh, adult women. They're prepared to be mothers. They're prepared to lead families. They're prepared to give leadership in the community, et cetera. That's sort of the rites of passage prepare you for. What is the function of the individual in the community from the age of, say, 20 to 40? Okay. What is their role in that community? So there's a rites of passage process to prepare you for that. And then when you prepare for the, the, the junior elder, which starts from 40 to 60, there's a rites of passage process to prepare you for that. And it involves ceremony, of course, dancing and food, but it involves, for the most part, training 
and concepts, principles, and ideas that should be a part of your personality practice on a daily basis in relationship to the other people in your community. And so rites of passage simply means preparing people for leadership roles in the community. Everyone in the community is a part of the leadership role. It means you must know what your function and responsibility is to children. What is your function and responsibility is to elders? What is your role and responsibilities is to ancestors? What is your role and responsibility into explaining and living out the notions of divinity? What is your role and responsibilities in making sure that the economic foundation of the community is secure, that the political foundation of the community is secure, that, that, that the cultural foundation of the community is secure? This is what rites of passage are. Before we had universities, the rites of passage process was the university. Mm. Get it right now. The, what we call in the rites of passage process, that was the university. And it wasn't something haphazard. These were societies of secrets for women and societies of secrets for men that people were prepared and they were taken from the village at a certain age by certain elders and, and teachers. And they lived in quiet places in the forest villages just for the purpose of preparing them for the next stages of life. That's today is called the university. That today is called the public school system. So don't let them play us cheap on what that is. That was the university system. That was the, the public school system. And it still exists in Africa. You can go to Liberia, you can go to Ghana, you can go to Nigeria, you can go to South Africa, you can go to Tanzania. These societies still exist to teach our children. The problem is white educational institutional constructs have been used to marginalize and even trample on the feet the African educational institutional construct that we call rites of passage. I hope that was made clear. Yes. You're supposed to say clear, brother, clear. Clear, brother, clear. <laughs> because sometimes yes. we act like it's just an aside. No. The culture is your university. Rites of passage is an aspect of that culture in terms of its function and training to carry out the body of knowledge that is contained within the culture and the language. You know, the language is like a ship, right? It's, it has all the elements of society on board and the language carries all those elements. Culture is the institutional construct, right? That teaches those elements to the next generation, carry out the intergenerational transmission of that body of wisdom that linguistically is held by the system of language that people have. And so you can't separate language and culture. And dancing is not culture, it's a tool of culture, okay? Singing is a tool of culture, drumming is a tool of culture. Culture is that body of knowledge, of wisdom that our people have gathered through all of the centuries and millennia that they feel need to be passed on to the next generation intergenerationally in order for the people to be better than they were. We call that whole concept as it, in its increments, rites of passage. It's clear. <laughs> yes, every, I'm, I'm, I am. And that it still exists. It still functions every day all over Africa. It's just been marginalized. Yeah. The white colonial imperialist educational system. It even goes on here in America, but it's been marginalized by white supremacist educational system. Same thing in the Caribbean. And so we look at our thing in fragmented ways, but I'm a root woman's son, right? My grandmother was a root woman. Um, the average person, I said, they don't have a clue. A root woman is a traditional African priestess. They brought it to America in their heads. They may have left their clothes behind and their shoes behind, but they did not leave their minds behind. And so they established in the Caribbean, we call it Obia in some parts, Voodoo in some parts, but that is traditional African 
wisdom systems. And we established rites of passages to try to teach over here at least fragments of that. But in Africa, especially places like Liberia and Sierra Leone, where you've got the, um, the Poro Society and other societies, they still teach this up front and center. You see the same thing in the Zulu nation. You see the same thing in Zimbabwe and the indigenous nation. It's just that we've got to push this poisonous white educational construct out of the way. And that's what we were trying to do with the Black Studies Movement that Dr. Jeffries and others led in this country. That's why he came up with this whole concept you know, of, of, of Afrocentric. Dr. Malefi talked about Afrocentricity. People were fighting against him, didn't understand it. Dr. Jeffries changed the department to the Africana Studies. There were people in Black Studies Department who was fighting with him for even changing the name from Black Studies to Africana Studies. They didn't understand the necessity for the transition to the higher spaces. Uh, but he did. Malefi did. Asa did. Jake did. Um, let me say Jake, Dr. Carruthers, you know, but I was a student among all of these men and I felt like they're sons. I, mean, I used to be in some meetings with my babies in diapers, okay, um, at these meetings. And so rites of passage is simply the way you carry out intergenerational transmission of wisdom mm -hmm. and the institutional construct you put together to do that. And before the invasion of the enemy, that was our primary education system. And it applies, it, it applies not only to the youngest, because you started early on this path, but if you're one of the royals, and there's a possibility that you might be selected to be the future king, then that process has special uh, rituals and pathways. This is the one of the greatest of our living kings. And this is the Asantahini in Ghana. And uh, we had a chance to meet him personally. He had a special uh, place in his heart for us because he knew we had come from the Africans in the new world and we were looking for comfort in being in Africa in their deep traditions. So he welcomed us into his royal spaces. He welcomed us into his private places. I have a picture of James Small's youngest child, uh, Akhenaten. And he was brought in to meet the king and shake his hand. You know, it's one thing to bow, it's another thing, but the king was so personally connected to us, he reached his hand out and had our mothers and our children, our wives participating. Rosalind was brought into the installment process of the, the the queen mother and the role that she plays in these rituals. And uh, we were at a big activity where the 25th anniversary of the king was celebrated at the stadium in Kumasi and the stadium rocked inside and outside. And we were so glad that we were able to get in and had honorary seats up in the stands. And we each of us had a cloth with the king's picture on it. And so we sat down comfortably thinking that we had a nice view what was going on. And then a military man grabbed me and pulled me to the side and said, uh, Mr. I need to talk to you. I said, well, certainly, brother. I got up and I walked over to him. He said, I have to redress you. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, you're wearing a cloth with the king's picture on it, but you have it upside down. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I had Negroes trying to be a part of this process. And luckily he pulled me to the side and had me putting that cloth on properly. And so then we could sit down, Brother Small, all of us were sitting down and we could relax. But then the, the, the sky opened with these drumming and the people shouting and screaming. And then we knew that the, not the king was just coming or the queen mother, but the golden stool was being brought out for the public to acknowledge it. And that golden stool uh, rocked the place. And it finally got inside. And then our great uh, brother, who's a paramount chief, who initiated uh, so many of us, Gary Bird, uh, the Garvey uh, uh, Jr., 
uh, as well as our sister segment, James and myself and my wife, all of us, Nana Akwatu Sapam, who made us a part of his modern development of, of Africa. And so he, he had us uh, follow the rituals and whatnot. But where were we? Well, we were sitting up in the stands. Now, see, we got a confusion with our foreign status and our African status. So he ordered us to come down immediately out of the damn stands and be on the ground with the royals. We had been welcomed into their tradition. We were royals. You ain't supposed to be Negroes sitting up there watching the activity. You come down so you greet the golden stool when it arrives and the king and everything. And we got down there just in time. But of course, my wife is interested in all of this. And so she was really having a tither because the people were taller than her. Mm -hmm. So some of the Africans saw that she was in trouble. So they said, sister, here, we are gonna put a chair here for you to stand up and take your pictures. And so when Rosen got up on that chair, who was coming in? Nana Afawasa, the queen mother priestess of Ashanti, who was so close to us, she is really family. And so Rosen was able to stand there and we were able to greet her as she was doing her sacred roles and rituals. That's a part of the, our relationship to Africa that we have to uh, put down uh, for people to appreciate and, under, and understand. It's real, it's for real. If it got so real that Brother Small is trying to beat me up, you know, he doesn't do it often, but he was mm -hmm. trying to beat me up. He said, uh, we went there for a funeral, I guess it was somebody's wife or the king's wife or something. And um, and Brother Small said, he never saw Dr. J so nervous. And, uh, but he was right because they have a tradition just as the old pharaohs had people to go to accompany them to the great beyond, they have a tradition of taking people. Uh, and so James said, we got out of Kumasi faster than we ever did. Well, Dr. Jeffries, that was the funeral of Yah Asantiwa when her body was brought from the Seychelles. Oh, yes, yes, oh, God. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So we, the, the, the culture is too deep for us just to take it lightly. And we yeah. need to share it and well, show Well, let me it. tell you all of the story. We went to Ajisu, not knowing we weren't supposed to go there from Kumasi because they were burying the body secret. And some people saw us and took us into their house. So you don't need to get inside this house. So you may be with Nana for eternity. And they <laughs> held us there until daybreak, you know, then we were able to drive on. Wow. But it's such a rich, it's such a rich and meaningful uh, culture that they need to bond it with the modern culture. They don't need to throw it away and take on some European culture like the judges in, in these English speaking former colonies. They're wearing these white powdered wigs as if they were in England somewhere. Uh, you can take the special Kenty cloth and have a special weave of Kenty cloth to represent the judicial wing. So luckily we're there to help uh, change things. But it's been a fantastic experience. We really can't uh, capture it uh, the way we need to, but it, it, it's it's real. It's, it's no. So that's why we come back, uh, Sister Felicia, to what is the model? Yeah. If you're gonna talk about, what do they call it? High value. High value right man. man. They got a model right there. Show me the models, and then I'll show you the high value. If you come to me dress all slick and owning all these things and having all your degrees, well, the people in Hitler who carried out all of that genocide against Black folks and other folks, uh, they had college degrees and doctorate degrees, and they, they invented the Mercedes-Benz and the Volkswagen, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what you're saying? You know what I'm saying? What's up? How you gonna drive around in Hitler's car and consider that making you high value while putting Hitler down? Hey, give it a break. You better look at the model, all right? So give me the model of the black man. Give me Magapule in Tanzania, who told the British, you owe us $9 billion for all of the diamonds you've been stealing. And until you pay that bill, we're not letting you take nothing else out of this country. Then you're going to renegotiate the contract, you mm -hmm. see? 
and until the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund back the heck up. And he took that money and redo the infrastructure in Tanzania. And he took that money and he built medical facilities in Tanzania. And he built universities in Tanzania. And how many of us know Magapule? Yes. You want a model to see what a high value black man looks like? Well, you know, yeah. um, you know, Professor, when you're um, so, you know, now I, I like your definition of a high value man. I like what you're talking about in terms of finding, you know, um, of, you know, showing you the model. So what what is it about the relationships that are happening right now and why we, we seem to not be able to stay together? Well, that's not quite true. So we have to also be very careful mm -hmm. that we don't fall into the trap that the enemy does by just talking about our margins and not our center, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Talking about our 3% and not our 96% or 97%, right? Because if you put together all of the folks that are involved in this um, violence in the street and those about people who have been trapped into drug use in the penal system, we're talking about three to six percent. So what about the other 94 percent? Do they get discussed? All right. We have millions of young people graduating from high schools and colleges every year at the top of their class. We don't have them being discussed. You turn on your TV every day, you see hundreds of black men and women and all kinds of status in the world as pundits and commentators and so forth. And we don't ask the question, where did they come from? We look at the African world and we see we have billionaires and millionaires. The discussion needs to be, how do we use African culture to aggregate African wealth intellectually, politically, economically, and culturally? And Dr. Jeffrey has been teaching this us from the time we met him. Yes. <laughs> not to be able to get the economic politics and culture, and I'm throwing the intellectually there. We have the wealth. We have the knowledge. We have the skilled people. They make up the overwhelming majority of our community. Africa have 1,742,000,000 plus people just on the continent. Wow. Off the continent, we got close to 1 billion more makes, when we bring the African conglomerate together, we are the most trained and educated race on the planet Earth, right? We sit on the greatest remaining wealth in the planet Earth in Africa and certain parts of the Caribbean. Right. What is missing in our discussion when people want to talk about the high-valued black men is that black man who can study history, get rid of the white man's mystery, work that black magic by bringing black people together and aggregating their wealth, their politics, their economics, based on a set of principles that we have had handed down as the body wisdom from our ancestors. And we don't have to reinvent a thing because we got it all already, mm -hmm. you see? Yeah. You just have to aggregate it, bring it together. See, and then what are the hope of saying know thyself? Absolutely. And then we have to, once we know it ourselves, we have to know the intricacies so we can teach it to the next group. Yeah. Because we've got everything we need. I don't care about no Chinese in Africa. We can run them out tomorrow when we become African again. Yes. You, you yes. either leave or we do what Dessaline says. What did Dessaline say to the French? He says, I've got a ship for you. I put food on the ship for you. I put water on the ship for you. I put weapons to protect yourself from pirates. And you will all get on the ship and leave Haiti because the crime you committed against us is too great for you to live with us. For those of you who will not go, I will practice coupetet bulekai. And when they, those who didn't go, he practiced coupetet Bulekai. He okay. took their heads and he burned their houses. And the world right. hates Dessaline, but that's why they hate Dessaline. Nobody say why they put Dessaline down. He said, the 2,000 of you left, men, women, and children, I told you to get on the ship. Your crimes against me were too horrific for me to live with you. You did not give on the ship. Goodbye. Kupatet Bulekai. In other words, the richest part of the French empire at that stage was Haiti which is only one third of the island of Santo Domingue. 
and that mm. so much wealth was coming from a thousand plantations. And then the leadership of the plantations, 1,300. And when they did not take the, the warning that the brother had made, and they were going to insist on maintaining uh, slave plantations and rulership, and they had lost Buleka Kupetet. And so they're going to try to make the pa Haitians pay for that forever. Uh, because, was, and they still are making them pay forever. Right. We need to understand. And that's why we've got to know the history so we know why and who and what we're dealing with and how to deal with them. And that is, is ours. We are to make the Africa we want to see. We must build the Africa we want to see. Absolutely. We must make Africa belong to us. And anyone that stands in the way of that, anyone that look like us, that allow themselves to be used to stand in the way of that, Kupetet Pulekai. That's mm. right. Yeah. And then we're building. We're not just knocking down and destroying the enemy. We're building a new world for ourselves. And so we're in the period of what we can truly call the African modern renaissance, mm -hmm. taking these small nations and, and kingdoms and whatnot and restructuring them. And so this is the symbol that the leaders of the OAU, when they try to fashion a, a better instrument than the O, uh, in other words, in 1963, they were able to establish the OAU. But when it became so bulky and difficult to manage, they had uh, an attempt to put the AU together so it would be more efficient. And at the same time, the head of South Africa, uh, Mbaki, and the head of Senegal, Wad, and uh, one of the Nigerian leaders, As uh, Obasanjo, they were asked to take the lead in fashioning an image of where we needed to go and the symbol of what we're all about. And so the most significant symbol of its kind was created. And it was manufactured in Korea, designed by Africans, and they brought it to be on top of a quiet volcanic hill uh, in Senegal. And this is the image, the rise of the black family. It's not a war memorial. It's not a, a worship of a particular a, a deity. Rise of the black family. And that family means not the, the, the father figure, but it means the father figure with the wife. He's leaning on the, his, his greatness coming from the wife. And they're holding up the product of her sacred womb to the universe. And that child is not playing with the father. The child is pointing to the future. He's not pointing north to Europe. The child is not pointing east to Mecca. The child is not even pointing south to the rest of Africa. The child is pointing across the Atlantic Ocean to the African populations in the west. It is the linkage of Africa, the continent, and the greatest population mix of African peoples in the New World. And you can go inside this monument. And it has an elevator that can take you six and 16 stories up through the mind of the, of the black man. So 30 or 40 people can be in his head looking out on the world. I was there with Mario B and some of the leaders from uh, ASCAC when we went. But what is more important, that this monument is a library and a historical uh, post for our people. All of the work of Dr. Shekhantadev, my wife and I were there when Shekhantadev's wife and the oldest son, uh, Mbaki, had the exhibit of Shek's great work in several tents. But that great work has been moved inside the monument with all of the other great works, the works of Garvey and Du Bois and, and other African leaders. And so inside it, you have places where the children can have plays, can have activities, etc. So this is a living monument, the likes of which uh, are not comparable. In, in Brazil, you have Jesus the Redeemer and the great statue of, given by the Italians from Italy, the Catholics there, to the largest Italian nation in the world, which was Brazil. But as for years, we went up like other people to this enormous statue, Jesus the Redeemer. But in 2003, when I took my nephew and his wife, who has now her medical doctor, so 
Uh, James, you can tell uh, your wife that there's another full medical doctor in the family. That's Hassan's. Oh, congratulations. Uh, and so I, we took them to Brazil with, we took her mother, who was a medical doctor, uh, sister. And so we had a group of about seven or eight of us going together. But it was this time when we went that they opened up the pedestal of Jesus the Redeemer. And I always felt some special power. I always said there's something here, but it, it wasn't clear. But they opened up the shrine of the Black Madonna uh, in Rio. And Raz and I were able to bring a replica. Uh, they had them available. And we have it right here in, uh, in our living room, dining room area now. But thousands of children can go on a daily basis and have activities there. And the great, uh, when 350 black men uh, and women went, Jesse Jackson and all of them, we were there, uh, Wade Nobles and his wife were there for different activities. And so we have to understand that these are not play things or cultural uh, manifestations to make you feel good. This is seriously making a statement that we are the founders of the human family. We took it to its highest level. And if we did it once or twice or three times before, we can do it again. Yes, yes, yes. African Renaissance. And you, and you know, um, Dr. Jeffries, can you explain to us um, what the um, the golden stool is? I you you had mentioned it, but just for um, you know some of our audience um, here, I got a I've, there's a picture of it up there. If you can see, can you just explain to us what the golden stool is? Uh, I have. Um, seriously been in the presence of the golden stool several times, but the person who I helped introduce the Akan tradition to and has done the greatest study on all of these cultures and their significant components is sitting on the other side of, the, of this uh, camera. That's James Fall. Nobody has put more time in over the last 30 or 40 years and studying these cultures and their significance. Mm, yes. So I would call upon my brother to let you know how deep this goal is in African cultures and how this goal is signifying the, the beginning of the culture with the component, uh, the, the creating factor. But, but nobody has studied better than James, and so uh, he, he needs it. He'll give us an explanation. Are you still there, James? Uh huh. Uh, and James has a stool name from the Akan, is Akan tradition in in, in Ghana, and it's uh, has part of that name is Ampasan. But give us the full name, James. Yeah, I'm, I'm Nana Kofi Ampasan the second of the Agogo stool, and the Nana Kofapong of our Oman Hini. Um. This stool, the golden stool, we hear about it when the British tried to capture it. When we hear about Ya Santiwa, we hear about the great warrior Yawar Santiwa, Ya Santiwa, who led the Ashanti nation against the British invasion. But she was protecting this, she was protecting the golden stool, she was the Queen Mother Bajisu. And so when the British had captured the small fort in Kumasi and had captured some of our great leadership at the time, the Queen Mother then said, I will call an army together. And she called an army together and took on the might of the British Empire. They eventually captured her, but they never captured the golden stool. The golden stool is considered to be the soul of the Ashanti nation. And the Ashanti is an Akan people who came to that area of Ghana primarily from the Northeast. Many aspects of the language and the name and the tradition will show you that they arrived over centuries into this area, having stopped further north into the ancient Ghana empire from Kemet, 
centuries before, when the leader of the small group of Akans called the Asantis today wanted to find a way to unite the nation that had been migrating in over a couple of centuries from different places, but they were small kingdoms. He called his priests. His the leader name was Osetutu. He would be called today Osetutu. And his priest was called the Okampo, the Kampo, but his name was Onochi. So he called his priests Okampo Onochi, and they got together with their elders and they appealed to God, the divine. And they called the meeting of all of the then heads of the major tribes. And the golden stool floated down from the heavens and landed on Osetutu, which then declared him as the, what we know today to be a Santahini. But that stool represents the soul of the Ashanti nation. Mm. It isn't just the stool. This is one of the most powerful religious relic in the world. They can talk about the, um, what's that cup they talk about, but it's a myth But that Jesus drank from. Nobody can find it. They could talk about the cross, but they've given away so many pieces, they could have built 10 crosses. So we know that ain't working. <laughs> this is the only spiritual relic that came from the heavens, according to the folklore and the history of our people, made out of gold, has never left the hands of our people and is still at the core of our people. And be clear, the British never conquered Ashanti. They won a few battles, but they had to go for, sign for peace. They never conquered most of the Akan nations and the other nations in what we call Ghana today. They had conquered the coastline, the coastline. But by the end of the 1800s, the early 1900s, when they invade us inland, we won most of the battles. They did win the major battle and took control of Kamasi for a while but they had to negotiate their way out because there was no peace up there for them in that way. And even after the Berlin Conference, when we are invaded by every European nation, an event which should be called the First World War, when every European nation in America who like to say, well, we didn't have any colony, they were at the Berlin Conference financing the other European nations yes. to invade Africa and steal her wealth and cut her up in the pieces we see today. But one of the centerpieces of Africa is the Yakan peoples of Africa, of Ghana, of Ivory Coast, and the Ashanti nation in terms of their defense against white invasion. And at the center of that nation is the spirituality and the soul of the nation, the golden stool, which ascended from heaven. Think of this golden stool and what it represents, and think of Ra. Look at it, is it not a sun, a symbol of a sun? So we have to pay attention to things. If you look at this stool right now, you will see the tools and the emblems of Aset. You will see the tools of Ra. You will see the tools of Haru, all in one stool. That is one of the most sacred African objects, spiritual in the world. In the world, yes. So. And we have, we have to appreciate that it's it's a living symbol. It it, it actually uh, it, it's it's not something in the great beyond. It, it's right. a part of the living various uh, sections of the Ashanti, and we really need to see them writ large. The Akan because you got the aqua mu and you got all these various groups that relate to each other through these symbols. And it's so real that uh, we were, I was asked to be part of the uh, celebration of the, the stool and the stooling. And uh, so I went to a go-go to get prepared. And uh, so they had the, 
the drumming. We, we, we're seeing the people's names flash up in terms of the donation. We want to thank all of you. And when we saw the Felder name, that's a special uh, great family of African men. And Jack Felder, Dr. Jack Felder was heavy in the struggle. In fact, he gave me one of my difficult things. He gave me the history of the Statue of Liberty and I took it to the world. And the people have been denouncing me ever since. But he was an African scientist uh, and he was always on 125th Street. Uh, Jack Felder was there selling his books and his materials and his son, Nova uh, followed him in that tradition. So thank oh, you. Oh, so that's oh. Nova. Okay. Yes, that's yeah. our brother. That's our young, very proud uh, achievement out of our struggle. And Dr. J, let me add something else to this so people can understand. This golden stool, if you look at some of the names, especially around the Kumasi area, the Ashanti names, you will see their comedic names. But when you do the genetics, the Yoruba nation and the Akan nation is 99% genetically the same people. So we think of culture and historical placement, and especially since colonialism and the Berlin Conference have separated us in these segments. But if you remove all of those things, remove those false borders, remove the new cultural names. You're really talking about one African people that have had different experiences in time and space and how yeah. they redefine themselves after having been pushed out of other segments of the continent by the early invasions of the Assyrians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians. Mm -hmm. This didn't just start in 1492. The assault on us started back in BC with the Alexanders and the others. Yeah. This is not a new war. This is the same war. This is a continuation. And that's why this golden stool is so important because the British came to steal this. They came to take it with their mighty army. They demanded it, but they never got their filthy hands on this sacred object. Where's it at right yeah. now? Like, yeah, where do they keep it at? Or is it? I well, mean I'm sure if you knew that, you wouldn't be here talking to us. Would you? <laughs> you know what? There it is. I love it. Okay. I've, I've, seen, I've seen it when it's come out. And the people, the stadium was filled. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And yet for 20, 30 miles, the kingdoms under their umbrella with their people were lined up still to come with their drummers and their dancers to pay respect to this the soul of the Ashanti nation. And it's, uh, it has greater reach. One of our people from Ivory Coast, Nyanga Rambur, doctor, had his degrees from the European institutions, but his deep work was in African symbols. And he produced this four volume work on the gold weight system of uh, Africa. And he was able to link up these symbols uh, to the Nile Valley. And so even though we see Africa fragmented, we have to see Africa potentially uh, connecting. And I had a, a perfect experience in that, that I was asked to come and uh, there was gonna be a special uh, cleansing around the golden stool. And so I'm always glad to go to Africa. My wife says, I gotta teach my classes, you go. And so I flew into Ghana. I thought I was had my proper attire, my little cloth and this and that. And uh, when I got there and they were doing this renewal, they they said that you're not uh, properly attired. So I, I said, damn, you, you're trying to do the best you can, but you can't, you know, you, you, you miss on so many things. But they work it out. In other words, the Chimahini who was in charge of relating to the African-Americans, African-Caribbean, the people being woven into the, the stool of Gogo. He was in charge of us, but he could not go because he was ill. So the council said that he cannot go. We do not want to have him leaving us on this, 
but Dr. Jeffries can go in his spirit. Now, I'm going representing James Moore and the rest of us, the African Americans, but they wanted me to have an, another role, which is to represent the brother who was given the task of pulling us together. And his, so they, all the little cloth I thought I had that I could wear, they said, no, no, you are wearing his robe. In his robe, you are taking his spirit and the work that he's done. So I was there in this, uh, his robe and I was feeling it. In other words, I, my Negroness had been escaping me and here comes this Africanness. And I was ready for it. So at four o'clock, they woke us up. They got all the drums and other things ready. Five o'clock, we hit the road and we was heading toward Kumasi and the big time. And I'm holding my breath. I said, this is going to be another one of those unusual great things. And sure enough, it was. We got there with all the drumming. Like James says, all of this greatness, this only Africans can produce this type of thing. You don't see no Nordics. You don't see anybody else, uh, uh, Italians doing this type of thing. And so then I sat with the 16 or 12 to 16 golden stools. They all had a formation because it's part of a military formation when they protect the kingdom. And so I'm sitting, trying to get a seat near Nana Akako Sapon, but the other Africans keep pushing me away. And they were trying to say, well, we don't know who you are, but we want to get close to our, our leader. And so I, I got tired of being pushed away. So I just got up and picked myself up and walked further down the line and found a nice place. And I set my stool uh, down and I was going to be there. Well, before you know it, here they come around that too, and they push me. So I wanted to do some fighting, but I said, no, your mama taught you to be dignified when you're in something important. So I, I got control of myself. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, a word comes from Bafo Okuto. He runs the nation. And he wants me to leave the stool formation and come to him in the center of the field to join him when he's having his meal. Well, that's the one time you don't go to African leaders. Eating the meal is something, something but he was offering me the meal. He wanted me to be at this occasion. He wanted me to share the meal. And then he talked to me like I'm a part of the group. You know, we have a real problem. I said, what is it, Nana? He said, well, we got a problem because the president of the nation uh, uh, Rollins is coming to Kumasi. He's bringing his tanks and his armored vehicles, and etc. And he's made a request to have a libation. And so Buffalo is saying, well, it can't happen. So I said, well, he's the head of the nation. Yes, but he's not the head of Ashanti. And once the stool has been libated for an event, you cannot just play with it and then give the and I thought, well, why can't they make just a little adjustment and let Rollins have a little stool? He's trying to do the right thing. But no, he wouldn't give in. In other words, those traditions were so fixed. But it was so wonderful to be there in the middle of us. I went back to my spot, and again, there was no place for me. But then the king was visiting each stool, had to get up and go visit him and re-swear the oath of allegiance. And I thought it was over. My behind was getting... Uh, uh, you know, I was feeling it. But then they said, no, that's only the first part. I said, well, there's more. And then the lights go out, it's dark, and we got candle lights. And here comes some drumming. And we hear this drumming. I said, what the hell is going on now? And here comes the king walking, not being carried, walking to each stool to show his respect to the respect that had been showed him. Wow. And so I, I said to myself, this is such a wonderful experience. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to try to be as cool as I can be. And he greets uh, Nana Sarpam, and he swears allegiance to the Golden Stool, protecting his school stool. And then he leaves. And he's waving at the people as he leaves. And I was so glad to be there. But then when he got to me, he stopped and said, Professor, you're here. We're glad you're here. I almost wet my pants. Oh. He stopped to greet me and talk directly to me. 
and that was a, and even those people who wondered who I was, they began to move, move, uh, you know, give me some space. <laughs> and then he went back to his special place. And I said, well, that's got to be the end of this. This thing is over. No, we're sitting here for another hour. And here comes the drums and what, and I said, what is going to happen now? And here comes the chief priestess. Here she comes, walking, paying respects to the respect that had been paid her. I was so humble. I said, there's no way in hell she's going to see me. There's no way in hell she's going to stop and greet me. I just, I gave in. I, I went down and I was hiding. I was down. I didn't want to have no eyes or nothing connected. But that's how powerful these traditions are. These ain't no normal people up in some woods doing some hocus pocus. There are people who created a very powerful cultural formation that we need to tap into some of that to get some understanding of why it is so powerful. Yes. Yes. So don't be messing with Dr. J uh, because he's hooked up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm definitely not messing with you, Dr. J. I'm not, I'm not messing with anybody. I'm just here learning. That was so, thank you so much. Oh, that was, yeah. I'm every, I'm every, all the thoughts that are coming in my mind, I'm just looking over to the side. I'm seeing everyone is saying them. Yes, it's powerful. Thank you for sharing. Ashe, Ashe, little red hearts. Thank you so much, Dr. J. Okay. Now, Brother Small is going to get mad. Because I, he don't mind the black power fist because he was in California uh, or, uh, a part of the time when I was doing the black power fist with John Carlos and them. Yes. Okay. But, but James, he does not want me to do. Don't tell him. I think he's not even uh, listening. But, you know, they had this fantastic movie. And all these years, oh. they've been about these messy movies, and they've been messing with us in the movies, Tarzan, and all kinds of mess. And here the brothers come with this heavy, heavy thing about Wakanda. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, because I never been to the movie where there were five generations of black families there, the babies the yet to be born in the womb, and the children, and the bigger children, and the grandparents. So I said, this is the most phenomenal thing. So I, I felt empowered to do my little Wakanda. This and that. And Brother Sosa, we got the real Wakanda. You ain't gonna have to be worried about no movie to produce. <laughs> hey! Yes, speaking of, yes. Number nine. And yes, can you just. Oh, yes. Wow. And the white fellow joined them too. The white fellow was from Australia or something, and he became a part of it. He, in fact, one of the gloves is his glove. The white fellow was there. He gave one of the gloves to uh, uh, either Carlos or Tommy Smith. Yes! Yes! So can you tell people who, who might not know who John Carlos is, can you just tell people who, who he is and the significance of this photo? If I started on that, we'd be here all night. <laughs> it's great Do it in a snippet, Dr. J. Give me a snippet. <laughs> all, all of these Olympics, uh, the white folks attempt to recapture the Greeks and to show the masculinity of the male. So the Olympics have always been a big thing, but racism is a part of America's game. So we never had an important role in the Olympics. But at a certain period of time, some of our people did get a chance. Uh, Jesse Owens and his Olympic brothers were given a major task to take down Hitler. Take him down, not in in France or not in England, not in America. Take him down in Berlin. He had handled the 1936 Olympics, and it was going to be the showing case of the superiority of the uh, German male. And the stadium for a quarter of a million people was built, and all of these other uh, 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 Nazi uh, proudness. But the Americans knew that they had speed in Jesse Owens, our great runner, in Jackie Robinson's brother, Mac, our great runner, and one of our people from East Stars, New Jersey, it was a great runner. Those three blacks were on the team and there was a, a Jewish guy who turned out to be a, 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 a 
news commentator for sports, they took him off of the American team, probably thinking that if the Jewish person was in with the blacks and they went out, would really mess with the Nazi theory. And so he, he sat down. And so the black men were so fantastic, running so magnificently, all of them, including Jackie Robinson's brother, Mac, that Hitler was so embarrassed that he was supposed to give them congratulations and medals and whatnot. Hitler took his ass out of the stadium and ran from Black Power. And so that Olympic stage was an, has been an important stage for our brothers and sisters. When the Mexican, when the Berlin one came, when the Rome came about, I was there in, in Rome at the time. And you had uh, uh, our great, one of my fraternity brothers, Rayford Johnson. He, he's won three Olympic decathlon members. And uh, I have a picture of myself receiving an award uh, in, in California because I was the president of Pi Lever Phi fraternity, happened to be a Jewish fraternity. He was, in, he was the president of one of the UCLA branches, plus he was the head of the fraternity there, uh, Rayford Johnson. He just passed and they gave him three quarters of a page uh, in the times and his great victories there. And so there is a story of the Olympics and, and, and greatness and Carlos and them uh, uh, were able to manifest it. Carlos had to leave the, the field, uh, the village, and I went to join him because my, my buddies, we had been in Los Angeles to fight the white scholars. And when that was over, we were free to go to Mexico. But we didn't have any money. So Harold uh, came to me and said, uh, they're raising hell in Mexico. We need to go down there. I said, how? How the hell are we going to go to Mexico? We just had enough money to make it from New York to Los Angeles and fight these white scholars in their meetings. He said, you don't understand. I said, I understand what I got in my pocket. He said, you still seem to understand. I said, why the hell do you keep saying I don't understand? How the hell are we going to go? We don't have any money. You don't need money. I said, what do you mean? Make yourself clear. For another $25 on your New York to Los Angeles ticket, you can go to Mexico City. I said, hey, let's go. <laughs> so we went down to Mexico City. And uh, I went to the diplomatic hotel. That's where Carlos was staying. I met him on the elevator. Uh, but he was getting prepared to leave. And I was just coming in. And so I stayed in the diplomatic hotel. And everybody knew that these black men were there. And so everybody was coming to the hotel, but Carlos and them had to leave the village. So who was coming out of the hotel? Another black man. Now, Carlos is taller than I, he's, uh, and so is uh, Tommy Smith. And these guys, their thighs are uh, double my thighs, you know, but a black man. And these women, everybody, men were coming and giving me hugs and kisses. And I couldn't say, no, hablo espanol. I, I, they didn't want to hear that. So I had to give and take all these hugs and kisses, but it was worth it. When the Jamaican team uh, started to do their runs, they, whenever they were victorious, the black fists went up. A white fellow who was Flawsby, uh, he developed, had the Flawsby flop uh, going over the high bar backwards. And every time he took his jump, he went up with the black power fist. Uh, one of our great brothers, he had the longest jump uh, in the world. His jump was so long that they said, we got to measure this again. No human can, can leap as far as he did. But the greatest thing was at the final, you had the marathon and you had all of these people yelling and screaming, 80,000 in the stadium and wondering, and I'm trying to wonder why are they so excited? And I didn't understand Spanish. I just enjoyed the excitement. But then he had come into the stadium ahead of everybody, one of the Ethiopian runners, he's the one that opened this thing up for the East African, Ethiopian, and Tanzanian, and Kenja runners. The man ran into the stadium ahead of everybody with no shoes on, wow. never forgot it. And so that's the, this, this greatness of the African male manifesting itself. And now the African females, of course, are gonna do the same thing. And so that's that was the... Uh, uh, yeah. Well, Dr. Jeffries, we're going to have to let Felicia go home. Happy talk is past 
seventh happy talk time. <laughs> it's past our bedtime. And 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 the tradition of Carlos and Thomas. I watch the women's gymnastic, the world championship, and the qualifiers. And I saw the filth of white supremacy and its ugliness throughout. Uh, the young lady, Jordan Childs, who's trained with Sister Simone Biles. Yes. Who, beyond any limit, nobody can reach Simone. She's just an out of space. Yes. But we watched, Carol and I, we were watching and watched them constantly underscore this young lady Childs in order to get these two white women on the team who didn't even qualify. Yes. There yes. was an Asian girl, Wong, who should have been on this team. Mm -hmm. And even the Asian girl, Lee, should have been in third place, not second place. Yes. But I watched them, sit, we watched for hours as they manipulated this thing. And then they went in the back and was going to make a choice of the last two. And I'm sure Simone had to speak up because they were mm -hmm. trying to cut Childs out of this thing. That's right. That's, uh, that's it's the It's just built right the down front of the center. Yes. So I think Biles must have told him, she don't go, I don't go. Okay. Okay. That's and their comradeship throughout the events have been so obvious and clear. They don't hide their blackness. They don't hide their Africanness. Right. Um, even the other young black women who were involved migrated towards them. But they tried to steal this thing. They couldn't steal it from Simone. She was, she was you know, yes. not anything. But they tried to steal it from Sister Charles. Mm -hmm. And she knew it. Yes. You could see her crying when she was going in the back. And I saw her parents get very upset up in the stand. Mm -hmm. And we saw them. She just had a perfect run. They gave her 13 something. Some little white girl stepped out twice and gets a 14. Yes, yes. And they had her halfway through the game up there acting like she had won, getting crudités, and then gave her a commercial Geico or something the week before. Yes. And then nothing to deserve having a commercial. Yes. Yeah. So the, what, 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 Carlos and Thomas did on that day, using, as you described, one of the most powerful institutions that white men use to try to show their prowess, that you have no prowess, yes. and that we're not only going to take mm -hmm. your gold medal and your silver medal, but we're going to heighten and bring attention to our struggle back in America. That's and right. so watching these two young ladies perform the other night, was just and watching their comradeship, because I also watched the qualifying uh, the, for the U.S. Open, and they were extraordinary there. And to yeah. watch them try to steal this thing, and the news people working with them in tandem, doing the centrifuge of language and description, when you're watching the damn thing. <laughs> so these right. are some dirty dogs. Well, they are definitely explain. So can but, you, oh. Uh, so can you explain the importance of the black fist you know, being put up in the air. Like well, that's, the, that's the black power fist. And when those two brothers, at that time in 68, our struggle was hot, it was on fire. But you found that the police department, especially in California, had become very genocidal against the Black Panther Party, a party that was not built around guns as they tried to make us think, even though they used guns as self-defense a party that was built around feeding the poor, a party that was built around putting health clinics together, a party that was built around opening breakfast programs for children in school who was going to school hungry, and other things they were doing in the community, a party that was fighting against police abuse by simply following them around and photographing them as they made arrests. And they turned on a group of young black men and women with a viciousness that no one had ever seen. So when those two brothers raised that fist, they brought the attention of the world to what was being called at this time the Black Power Movement. Right. Because they had marginalized that aspect of our movement while they were elevating the Southern aspect of the movement, which they called the Civil Rights Movement. That was a Black movement. It had aspects to it certain elements in the South, certain elements in the Midwest, certain element on the East Coast, West Coast. 
when they raised their fists in Mexico, another country, in solidarity with that movement that was known to the world as the Black Power Movement, it brought us on a world stage um, in, in, in a way that most people won't understand. And I'll give you an example. Because <clears throat> I was in California in 68, but I was in the extreme north. Um, when I went to Mecca in 74, and I had to meet with a council called the Rabat Alim al Islami, the World Muslim League. They credentialized all of the imams of the world that carry their credentials. They couldn't meet with me because they said they were having a, a special meeting. So they sent a couple of elders to meet me and they said, maybe the whole council will meet with you tomorrow if you could come back. And I go like, I'm not coming back. Y'all meet, meet it. So they couldn't. So I'm, I'm meeting with the two old men. Somebody comes in the room and says, the whole council wants to meet with you. So I'm like, okay, that's not, I'm very sick with malaria at the time, Ooh. but I made it a point I wanted to do this, right? In comes the whole council, almost a hundred elders, the leaders of world Islam, the most powerful men in the world in Islam. And the reason they came in the room to meet me, because there was a group of young men in black berets, black shirt, black fatigues, pants, and black jungle boots that heard that the black American was there and they stopped the negotiations they were in to meet with me. And this was the Muslim guerrilla army of the Philippines who was negotiating with Marcos, who was then the president of the Philippines. But they heard that this black American was there and they stopped the negotiations that we wanna meet him. So they come into this room, they fell to their knees on one knee and raised the clenched black fist and said, Black Panther, Black Power. Mm. In the middle of Mecca, in the <laughs> middle of the Rabat Alim al Islamin, that's how powerful that fist that those brothers raised in Mexico affected the rest of the world. These young men in the jungles of the Philippines fighting an armed war of resistance, dressed like they're Black Panthers, mm. Mm. ended their negotiations for the purpose to meet and shake hands with one black American man who just happened to show up at the Rabat Alim al Islamim, where the world was negotiating this peace treaty. That's how powerful that fist was in Mexico. Mm -hmm. yes. But I know you have to get some conclusion. I need to get some rest. I was doing that uh, yes. today. Yes, My body is done. Yeah. <laughs> I need to slip in the youngest of the Jeffries. He's doing his thing. That's Dr. Hassan Jeffries, honor graduate of Morehouse and on to Duke, uh, where he was considered one of the best students. And his st uh, study was on the struggle for the vote in Lowndes County. And that involved Kwame Ture, uh, Stokely. It involved Willie Ricks and the others. And so uh, the struggle for the vote in Lowndes County he was so glad that I had tried to get them all to go to school down south so they could get a taste of that south and not just this urban. Uh, so he did his, his PhD and that work was the struggle for the vote in Lowndes County, which all of them uh, said he was able to gather, gather so much activity going on around. They were so busy doing what they had to do, uh, uh, but he was able to capture the whole flow and uh, he, he won a prize. Uh, for that uh, uh, the struggle in Lowndes County. And Willie Ricks always jumps on me and says, you know better. Stokely did not, he wasn't the one that raised the cry. He took it from me. But since Stokely was the most articulate uh, of all of them, uh, Stokely carried it worldwide. Well, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> no, no, let's get back to what your question was. What was that question? That's how we'll wrap it up. We, um, the high, I think you answered the question very well. Um, the but notion you always of summarize I, what you've done, yes. Okay, uh, we invented that in ancient Kemet. You must have a summary, you must have a summary. Well, the summary is clear just to say to them through the 
Dr. Jeffrey's talking about the Santahini. He talked about Bapa Okutu. He talked about Nana Sapang. He talked about Camarolai. We talked about Thomas and Carlos. We talked about other great names. Those are the models that if anybody is to make the statement, what is it called again? High high valued high man. High value black man. Yes. If they're not modeled after the likes of the people we've been discussing, then they're not talking about value. Mm. And then right near your head, as you have this beautiful, gorgeous look with all those books and stuff behind you. Oh, that's Jungle. Right. That's my book. What I've been working on. But one of them is you see a little bug spray. And that's a, a little bug. Oh, yes. But one. no, put to the little the bug spray right next to it. Okay. The move that I, but that is the book of books. That's by a black man from Mississippi who was who survived the miseducation of black folk in Mississippi. And then he came out of Mississippi and made it to Atlanta. And he survived the Negro achievement education of Atlanta. And then he made it up to New York and he survived the Jesuit miseducation given in the Catholic schools. And he was able to produce one of the most dynamite uh, books. It's the book that needs to be modeled as a blueprint for black power. We need a blueprint yeah. for woman power, a blueprint for, yes. And so he was one of our greatest, unfortunately, James, he was at Hostock and uh, uh, he was at uh, the the uh, Latin College in the City University, Hostos. And uh, I would have given him a, a tenured uh, seat at City, but you can't move across lines. You, you, you have to go horizontal. So right. he, we, we could have helped him with his great work if he was with our family. But he still, he put a team around him and though uh, uh, oh. Tababu and the rest of them. Well, let, me, let me smack King Simon for a minute. Put it back up there again, his little statement. Black power without spiritual power and green power is no power. Well, if you got black power as black power, then you got spiritual power. And what black power is about is seizing green power. See, black power don't have to be broken down. Black power is all inclusive. It's about economic, politics, and culture. And at the core of your culture, my beloved young brother, so I'll be smacking you up a little bit. You know how much I love you. But at the core of your culture is your spiritual system. And your black power is about economic politics and culture. It's about controlling land, labor, and resources. It's about being in charge of making the African world the world we want to see. That's what he meant by black power. Mm -hmm. And when you read the document, it's very clear. But I understand the context, Brother King Simon, because you know you're my main man. Because some people want to jump on just the economic piece. No, that ain't going to work. And then someone to jump just in spirituality, no, that ain't going to work. You got to cloak it in the blackness. Some people said, why do you say black? And people get into the whole word thing about etymology and all of that stuff. Keep playing those games. We'll come back and see you after the revolution is over. Not you, King Simon. I'm talking to the others who do that. Okay. So we, we black is inclusive about all. When we say Kim, we say black. Kemet, black. You know, it includes everything. And when we're talking about economics, politics, and culture, we're talking about a systemic process to sustain it and to revise it and to use it. So we're talking about systems analysis leading to system capability and system greatness. That's where we want to go. Right. So King Simon, though, I'm, I'm his big brother and I love him dearly. That, that's one of my favorite brothers in the whole world. So he just gave me a chance to break that down a little bit, King. Because a lot of times um, brothers get caught up in, and don't understand the meaning of a statement, not you, because me and you, we know where we are. But I, I see a lot of stuff online with a lot of the younger people. When we say black, we mean what we mean. I don't mean what the white man means when he say black, okay? Mm. 
Yes. It's like when I say love, I mean what I mean. I don't mean what the white man mean when he say love. Mm-hmm. You know? He may say Egypt all he wants, but I say Kim and Kemet and Kemet Nu. I mean what I mean. And we have to stop letting his meaning of words be the dominant element in what we trying to say. Because we are the world. We are the universe. He's just the mutated thing within our sphere. It came into being, it will go out of being and we will still be here. It's like this virus. It comes, it'll go. It is like a virus. It has done all the things to the world that a virus does. It will go. We can speed it up if we inoculate ourselves with blackness, meaning the wisdom of our ancestors and the totality of our divine beingness, which comes from that wisdom, then we will become the inoculation against nothingness, which we call whiteness, but it's nothingness. They've built nothing. They've only copied and stolen from others. So they have no modeling. So when we talk about this extraordinary man, there's no models there. I can't have a bunch of murderers and thieves and rapists to be my modeling. Okay? Yeah. Let's be clear. And in the making of men, you have to have women. And as I say goodbye to our family, I'm holding up the homegoing ceremony of Queen Mother Dorothy. Uh, she was a leader in and Cobra, and they just had a wonderful uh, conference on the internet. And she went to South Africa, went to Africa and got ill, but she was a, a, a as dynamite an individual helping black men make their way through the world as possible. And so this is her on the front page. And then as they close it out, there she is, the sands of times on the roaring ocean saying goodbye to all of us. And we will have to say goodbye (laughs) until we meet again to continue this great march of the African spirit, man, woman, and child through the universe. All right, so we'll close it by saying a high-valued black man is determined by the black woman, period. And they have to, and they have to um, see the world through the divine first, and then the, um, at, then Africa, then family, then themselves. Absolutely. Wow, good job. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for coming on. Um, this was. This is great. I will have to um, actually look at this one you, back because when you're when I'm sitting here, it's like I I'm hearing what you're saying, but I need to sit with this one for a minute. You guys gave out so much good stuff and so many stories I haven't heard before. Um, you know, so I'm always that that's that's what's up. Thank you guys for coming on. Peace okay. and blessings to you and to Dr. Jeffries and Sister J. Yes, and to, and to the family and t- for you to feel comfortable back there. With all my stuff in there. I said, hallelujah. It's like, it's, mm-hmm. Listen, it's hot up in here, Dr. J. This is like Africa. Mm-hmm. You yeah. you have Africa right here in Jersey in this room. <laughs> all right, now. Thank you. Thank all you. Peace and blessings. Power to all people. Peace and blessings. <laughs> okay, fam. This was exciting. I know you guys will have to look at this one again. Remember, uh, just a couple of few announcements for those that joined um, late. I want to also give a, sp- a special shout out to um, King Simon and, and Asar Imhotep. I saw you guys in the um, chat and thank you, um, uh, King Simon, for being so gracious and, um, and allowing us to, um, to learn from you. So thank you. Um, we are at the African Street Festival, the International Afri- African Street Festival tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday. If you are in the New York area, come by the tent. We are going to be doing all types of stuff. Um, we're going to have, we're going to be doing lives. We're going to be talking to people, taking pictures, selling DVDs. We got the Hoppy DVD, the digital download, beautiful t-shirts. We have posters. We have some books. We have a lot of good stuff in that tent. So I'm just saying, you guys got to come by. 
Um, we're going to be out there rain or, sh- rain or shine. We will be out there Friday, tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, so, uh, you know, usually when I uh, leave, I'm always like thinking who I'm going to say, you know, like how I'm going to say goodbye. And I always just love Dr. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, Professor James Small when he just says peace and blessings. So peace and blessings, Black family. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?